Additionally to that, I would like to thank Mike, say behind me, Big Cabbage Radio. They are doing live web streaming for us this evening. So round of applause for Big Cabbage Radio. <laughs> Testing, testing. I better start that 60 seconds over. Uh, it usually takes me about 60 seconds to say hi, but um, my name is John Alcantara. I lived in Palmer area most of my life. I've lived in the city for a little over 20 years. After living in Eagle River, Juneau, and Soldotna, my wife Rosetta and I and our four kids moved to Palmer and raised our family here. I've been on the council about two and a half years. I myself a centrist, pragmatic voice on the council, and uh, uh, I love Palmer. It's a great place to uh, raise a family. It's a great place to be. And uh, like I said, I've been here most of my life in the surrounding areas, and uh, I look forward to the uh, discussion tonight. And I thank uh, the Rotary, Cheryl, Josh, and all the others for uh, having us here. So uh, I look forward to your questions, and I look forward to the questions that we've already been provided. Thank you. Thank you, John. And Nathan, and, and just so you all know, there's one microphone. I have one, and our candidates have one. So they're going to be passing that microphone back and forth. There'll be a little bit of pause here and there. So Nathan, if you please introduce yourself. You have 60 seconds. <laughs> Now. <laughs> <laughs> Audrey, would you like to go ahead? No, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nathan. Uh, yeah, um, my name is Nathan Bradford. Um, I've lived in the Valley most of my life. Um, my wife and I bought a house within the limits of Palmer about three years ago. Um, I graduated Colony High School, graduated University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, very proud of being an Alaskan and living in Palmer. Um, I work at Matanuska Telephone Association, and um, yeah, just looking forward to the questions, and thanks everyone for coming. And Victoria Hudson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Victoria Hudson, and I'm currently here before you as a candidate for City Council. At 30, I'm dedicated to bringing a fresh perspective to our community. A big thank you to the Rotary Club for hosting us tonight and fostering this dialogue. 
If I am successful, proper residents can be assured I will decide issues based on the, what the facts substantiate, not simply hearsay, propaganda, or unproven speculation. I believe all sides of any issue need to be considered, utilizing every instrument at the county, the council's disposal, from community input to on-site evaluation. Citizens of Palmer, as well as all the Valley, can rely on me to use my strong moral sense of what is wrong and what's right before I cast any vote on their behalf. I have spent endless hours doing my research and meeting with many local business owners and landowners in our city to find out what is happening, what the city needs, and asking for ideas of how I can make a positive impact. I have a deep understanding and appreciation of the value of services community, and I am so grateful to all of you for this opportunity. Thank you. My name is Andre Jackson. I want to start off by saying, first of all, I did not receive this question in advance until now, so what I have to say to answer these questions are going to be basically my experience in this community since 1998. And I've been part of this community for a long time. And I continue to love this community for the organization I belong to is the National Bible Kingdom Foundation. And with that foundation, we're able to bring a lot of social justice and a lot of events to this community that help aid uh, businesses in this community. So my love for this community goes deep. My campaign just did, just not, didn't start 10 minutes ago or three months ago. It started in 1998. Many of you I met doing over in that time period. So I was really campaigning then, showing you how much I love my beloved community by being out there, by talking to people, by helping people, by joining people, by fixing tires and, and what have you. So I've been around quite a while. And I think we are over here for this opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, we've made the decision since Andre did not receive the questions in advance, we're gonna bypass candidates, those pre-addressed questions. And we're just gonna go into regular questions that I have and then questions off the floor. Um, I think that's the fairest for all concerned. Are you all comfortable with that? Sure. Of course you are. Great, thank you. Yeah, and, and thank you so much for your understanding. All right. This threw me off just a little bit, but I'm coming back. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start. Uh, I think what we'll do, Andre, since you have the microphone, we're going to start right with you. And this is not a question that was given in advance, so you're all on the same playing field. What is your position on annexation? Do you believe it could positively affect Palmer's future? And would you support moving forward on previously conducted annexation studies the city has completed? I do believe that it's, it's important that we do annex. And one thing I'm concerned with that when we annex, that those individuals that live in that, in that vicinity, um, they can have an address as far as Palmer, but they can't vote in Palmer. And I think that's not fair to have people that live in the Palmer area be annexed in the area and not be able to, to vote in city elections. Next, I think when we annex, that does kind of create an opportunity to get a tax base from, from that area to expand our water and our sewer to that area, area that are going to increase our revenues for our community. Okay, Victoria, you want to add Would you like me to repeat the question, or are you comfortable with it? You can repeat it. All right. What is your position on annexation? Do you believe it could positively affect Palmer's future? And would you support moving forward on previously conducted annexation studies the city has completed? If our current infrastructure is not fully supported, then adding projects to our current budget and annexing land may not be best. I would work to ensure that all former citizens have the opportunity to be informed and knowledgeable about new projects and their opinions considered. Thank you. Nathan? Um, the short answer is I, I do support annexation. Um, when you look at a town like Palmer, we have a lot of sprawl. We have a lot of neighboring communities. You go up the Glen, you go down Palmer Fish Hook, you go out to the view. These are people that 
shop here, pay our sales tax, and there's a really good case to be made that they should be supported by the revenue that they give the city, um, as well as given the opportunity to vote. Um, but <clears throat> if you read the most recently published study they did on annexation on the city website, um, one of the issues they highlighted was less than favorable public opinion about the annexation. And so I do think that it has the potential to be really beneficial to these communities, but I also think that it is on the city to foster that trust for the community to make sure that it's something that everyone actually wants. Thank you. John? Thank you. Um, annexation obviously can be a bit of a sticky wicket, but the reality is that people that live outside of Palmer sometimes don't even know they're outside of Palmer. They're like, what? I don't live in Palmer, but I'm right out here by Four Corners. I'm out here in Equestrian. I'm out here in other spots. They don't even know if they're in the city or not. Uh, we provide service for a lot of people, but don't forget that of our tax revenue, 85% of it comes from sales taxes. So my buddies up, up in Soapstone and Lazy Mountain and the Butte that shop at Fred Meyer and Carter's and Palmer and shop at other places in uh, local businesses, they're still providing some of the revenue. But we need to take a good look and not just blow the dust off the old studies. We need to be serious about it, take a look with the new council and say, is this something we want to proceed with? And uh, I think there could be value there. It's just something that's gonna take time and we're gonna have to uh, bring it to the people to make sure that their needs are addressed. Thank you. Thank you. And if you pass the microphone to Victoria, please. Our next question. The construction or repairs of Palmer's library has been a contentious issue, with differing opinions on its cost, contents, and overall necessity. What is your position on the library project, and how do you plan to address community concerns regarding its budget, long-term benefits, and the role it will play in Palmer's future? First, I want to start off with, um, I think a library is very important in the community. Um, I also want to um, start with that election statistics show that only 6% of our voters turned out to vote on the $10 million bond last year to finance the new library. Despite claims that 80% of the town voted for, only 6% of the town's voters casted a vote. So that's 5% of the town that agreed that we needed to have a $10 million bond for the library. So I do agree that there needs to be a library and even making a new library, and that's great, but I don't know how much of our city's funding uh, up to $10 million should be put into that library when there's a lot of other projects in the community that need to be finished, like our roads and our new wells and whatnot. Thank you, Victoria. Andre? I say we need to get built. As long as we wait, as people know, that we can go any day. Materials cost, they go up. Um, we're not building this by ourselves. We have a barrel to help us out to build this library. Well, the infrastructure of the library, um, there's been a lot of controversy about banning books. Personally, I think no book should ever be banned. It's a library of collections of works. What I am concerned with that this is a dull thing that it needs to be regulated and let the parents decide if the child can have access to it. Because if we start banning specific books for a library that's designed for the community, for this area, what's gonna happen is you'll ban books dealing with different heritage, native heritage, African American heritage, and I don't think that's right because this is a, a community, and this library is designed for the community. Thank you, Andre. And yes, if we could pass that to John, please. I see the system we're in here. It's a good one. Um, yeah, folks, let's be real. 17 months since we had a collapse, or 19 months, excuse me, we had a collapse. We had the vote. 80% of folks said, let's move forward with a potential $10 million bond. We're going to build an $18 million library. We've already trimmed it down a bit. Uh, former Mayor Delana Johnson, state representative, was able to get us $5 million in the last year's budget. She's like, you know, hey, what's happening with this thing? Um, we need to move forward. We took our time, uh, we addressed a lot of the issues. Some of the issues are still being addressed now, insurance money and other things. Everything takes time. The former project manager, I know nothing ever goes as quickly as folks would like it to go. 
but it's time to move forward with doing our library. I want to see that thing completed by December of 26 and not be something we're talking about uh, three or four years from now. And thank you. Thank you, John. Nathan? Uh, my answer is going to be pretty short. Um, how it feels been pretty well covered. Um, we were. This wasn't really something that was optional. It wasn't a remodel. It was something that needed to be done, and it's been quite some time since that need arose. Uh, the city drafted an RFP, got competitive bids, and decided to move forward with some plan with some budget. And I think that it's just time that they get built. And uh, beyond that, I don't have an opinion. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, because we did pull the uh, original uh, questions that were given to candidates in advance, we do have time to take questions off the floor. So if you have one of those note cards filled out, please hold it up and one of our Palmery members will pick that up for us. While that's taking place, candidates, I have our first question. Nathan, we'll begin with you. Matsu Borough Assembly members now have the option of showing if they are a Republican, Democrat, or non-affiliated. The question I'm asking you is, are you a Republican, Democrat, or non-affiliated? And will you do the same ordinances like the borough? Um, I would say non-affiliated, uh, consider myself libertarian, and on as libertarian as I think is reasonable. Um, and so I consider myself center left on some things, center right on other things, but generally speaking, um, very oriented on small and, and, uh, and uh, meaningful government, so. Okay, thank you, and John. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, like 60% of Alaskans uh, that are registered undeclared are not partisan. I'm registered not partisan. Um, I don't think party affiliations have a place in city council. I think city council is about what you do for the city, not what you do for a party. I don't think we should uh, worry about when we're on city council, what's the Republican party think about this? What's the Democrat party think about this? That's a, that's a wrong mindset to have when you're trying to address the issues of the city. So uh, I don't think the law is on the ballot. It's okay the borough wanted to do it. Um, party affiliation really should have little, if anything, to do with whether you support a person running for city council. This uh, city council should remain nonpartisan, and I'm happy that I'm registered as a nonpartisan. Thank you. Thank you, John. <coughs> and next, we'll go to Andre. When I ran for this campaign, I purposely did not accept donations. And I purposely did not have a party affiliation attached to my name. I did not go out and seek candidates that are in the Republican or Democratic Party to support me because it's a nonpartisan position and I support that. Um, I think that come with John, that it's important that you don't, not, you're not influenced or you owe anything to the particular party affiliation. Now, some of you, I'm sure, have already looked it up that I am a registered Republican. I've been since 1998, it just didn't happen overnight. So that being said, I don't want that as an influence because I can't go across party lines and I don't always vote the party line. And so my whole thing is that when you in a nonpartisan position, you should, should stay that way and remain that way, thank you. Victoria. Hold. Um, I don't feel like there's any other leg to stand on. Um, when I'm looking at city council issues um, that have to do with the city, I feel that it's good to look at both sides of the issue. And I personally, except for a few things, I really think it's what's right and what's wrong. And there has to be some moral backing behind that. So thank you. Thank you. Andre, we're going to go back to you with this first response. What infrastructure projects do you think are most important to moving our city forward? 
I think the first thing that we need to do as the infrastructure is deal with ethics within the city council and at the police and fire department. We need to have a strong stand that if you take up both to support in the Constitution of the United States and also the bylaws that govern the city, then you should stand by that. The infrastructure I think that we need to look at is we need to look at our roads, which is important in the airport, which is also important. Now, I don't fly, I don't use the airport, but I use the roads every day and pretty much the sidewalks too. So I think the infrastructure need to, to, to maintain what the citizens want, which is, has been uh, the roads itself. And so when we continue to move forward as a city, we need to look at building a better infrastructure when it comes to plowing equipment and having plowing teams to get through the city. Victoria, give me one moment. Are you able to hear well in the back? Is this good? Perfect. Thank you so much. Victoria. <coughs> okay, can you repeat the question? I can. Thank you. What infrastructure projects do you think are most important to moving our city forward? I do believe that um, there's a lot of necessary infrastructure projects that we need to focus on. First, one of those projects that we need to focus on is the wells. We cannot continue down the path that we're on right now without fixing the wells or adding more wells because we're adding on more residents' homes and more businesses. Also, there's parking issues downtown that we need to focus on, and we also need to work on upgrading the streets and getting some uh, paved streets and roads. Okay, then you feel past that to Nathan. Um, <clears throat> I think some of the uh, low hanging fruit in infrastructure would be to really focus on finish the pa finishing the paving on some of the roads within the city limits that are not paved, have not been paved, remain unpaved. Um, they require an enormous amount of maintenance to keep them drivable. Um, the other thing that came up a lot when I was talking to people door to door was, especially people with kids, would love to see some attention dedicated to the public parks and playgrounds. Um, so cleaning those up, making them more interactive for kids, uh, more attractive to kids so that they have some safe place that they gravitate to, I think that's huge. Um, beyond that, I think you know the city's done a good job. I live in city limits, obviously. When it snows, a plow shows up quick. When the grass gets long in the park, a uh, lawnmower shows up. Um, you know, beyond that, I, I can't ask for much, but I, I, I do think that um, there are a few things that we can focus on that are easy wins. And that's the real uh, crux of being on city council. It's really nuts and bolts, getting things done, water and sewer projects, other type of projects. And we talked about the biggest infrastructure project we need, speaking of a place our children can go to, is our new library get built here in the next couple of years. Um, we got bone rattling and very dangerous crossings here in uh, fireweed and streets. Uh, and we need to fix railroad crossings, partner up with the railroad, fix some of those things. Um, and you know, I wouldn't don't call it infrastructure. I don't want to see uh, Pay Paradise and put up a parking lot, but I do know parking is a huge uh, problem and we do need to address that, whether that's in that infrastructure piece or whatever just a plot of piece of land somewhere and create some parking. But uh, there's plenty of projects that we're doing constantly and the library is my number one. Thank you, John. All right, Nathan, we're going to start with you next. And I'm going to meld two questions here, so listen carefully. Who do you consider your primary constituents? Are they limited to city limits? And what value do you add to the council? Um, I think my primary constituents uh, are not limited to the people that live within the city limits of Palmer. Uh, I think as we touched on earlier um, in the annexing question, uh, Palmer has, I think, five square miles-ish um, within its limits, and we are, you know, hopefully a hub for a big surrounding area. So while those people might not be able to vote, they 
pay taxes here, and I think that it's worth considering in any way possible, be that some sort of outside research or, you know, unfortunately because they can't because they can't vote or participate, there's really nothing else that you can do. But I do think that it's important in any way that we can reach out, that we are reaching out to the neighboring communities and making sure that Palmer is the hub we want it to be. John? Michelle, sure, can you repeat the question for me? I sure can. Who do you consider your primary constituents and are they limited to city limits? And what value can you add to the council? Thank you. My primary constituents are the 5,100 registered voters and their families in the city of Palmer. Yes, we have lots of folks contributing from outside areas, but that's the uh, five square miles of the residents that we need to deal with. The value I add is a lifetime of relationships throughout Alaska. I can go to Juneau, get in any legislator's office, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. Uh, I know the governor, I know people, I know how to uh, address the issues, I know how a capital budget works, and uh, I bring a lifetime of experience in emergency management, in uh, finance, and I'm willing to work with anybody, uh, regardless of political affiliation, and move the ball forward for the city of Palmer, and I'll continue to do that. Thank you, John. Victoria? to um, kind of, I guess, like when I introduced myself, I kind of started with what I could bring to the table, but I just wanted to cover that again. So obviously a fresh perspective, I'm not interwoven into a lot of the uh, relationships of people with the city politics or even with state politics. So what I bring to the table is a fresh set of ideas and also a fresh set of relationships with people. And also um, I will be able to talk to people and make relationships and really utilize everything to my advantage to go and see projects. And I also think it's very important that you have somebody on the council that is a good listener and that it has time to meet with everybody. And so, thank you. Andre. Not only the city of Homer, uh, people the individuals, but the businesses that are downtown, small businesses, or my constituents too, I consider to be just as important because those people also are residents as well. One thing I think is important that we need to make sure that these businesses thrive uh, throughout the summer months, but for the winter months. And I do think that we need to continue to, to grow in that area, we need to grow. Um, this city is still a small town, it's one of the beautiful small towns in this area and in the state. And we can still keep it small, but we also need to be reminded that the businesses are more important because that's kind of what keep, keep uh, the infrastructure going. Thank you. Thank you. Andre, if you will retain that microphone, we are going to start with you followed by Victoria, then John, and then Nathan. With low voter turnout and recent statements that council doesn't need to engage the public for input on specific capital projects, how will you ensure and increase community involvement in decisions with great public impact? I sure will, that's a lot of words. <laughs> With low voter turnout and recent statements that council doesn't need to engage the public for input on specific capital projects, how will you ensure and increase community involvement in decisions with great public impact? I think one of the things that we have done at the Ron King Jr. Foundation is that our event itself brings life to issues within the community, whether it be uh, emergency situations or whether it be uh, opioid crisis. So I think that if you're going to make the decision, you have to be able to reach the community outside of the, the voting issues because a lot of people don't show up to vote, but they will go to various different events. So I think encouraging people to get involved in the community is one way to do that. Thank you. All right, Victoria. The, um, sorry, can you repeat the question? 
2022. Thank you. With low, voter, with low voter turnout and recent statements that council doesn't need to engage the public for input on specific capital projects, how will you ensure and increase community involvement in decisions with great public impact? I think what's being talked about here is the consideration to remove such a landmark with the railroad tracks. And um, that was stated that it wasn't for the community to have input on um, recently, that that was something that the city council could decide on. And I think that any project that, that's, that is that big, that affects our history, even events that are downtown locally, I think it's very important that the community come together and be able to at least express their feelings about the situation and to be able to come to a city council and also have a part in making those decisions. And John, you're quick on your feet, thank you. <laughs> so pretty quick for an old guy. Um, yeah, low voter turnout. Low voter turnout, I heard about the 6% in the bond. Wasilla recently had an election with 1.9% turnout. Not to cast shade at our neighbors, but literally less than two out of 100 people showed up to vote. I don't want to ever see low voter turnout. I love everybody in this room and in this city to prove me wrong and have 20, 30, 40% voter turnout on October 1st, on Tuesday. I know that that's probably not likely. But I, I do think, uh, I don't remember this thing about not getting some council saying that you need the public's input. I think we always look for the public's input. Uh, we have, unlike some places, two opportunities for audience participation in our council meetings. We give people two chances to come address the council for up to six minutes in total and let their feelings be known. And some people do show up to do that. So uh, everybody get involved and let's, uh, let's have more involvement. I'm all for that. Nathan. Yeah, um, so professionally I do something called market research. Um, it's a fancy way of saying I field surveys. And um, you know, people are busy, really busy. They can't make it to meetings. They, maybe they don't know when to vote. I mean, you know, we could argue all day about whether or not the onus is on them to keep track of those things, but the easiest way to get an answer is to ask. And I think when it comes to specific capital projects, um, there's a lot that the city can do in terms of third party research and making sure that we're actually asking pointed questions about the projects that are coming up on um, whether or not we're gonna do them, how much they're gonna cost, how we wanna approach this. Um, waiting for people to show up is one way to do it, but I, I, I think it's much easier to just ask. Thank you very much. All right, this next question, I will start with you, John, followed by Nathan, then Victoria, and lastly, Andre. John, how do you feel about trails and pedestrian-friendly connectivity? How do I feel about it? I, I think it's fantastic. I hope that, uh, you know, I, I utilize every trail I can, whether it's out here, uh, Shane Woods uh, Memorial, or the trails out to the Butte, uh, bike out there and get uh, a big butte uh, burger. Uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity here. There's a lot of value in the fact that people want uh, this nature. I love looking out at Pioneer Peak, at Matanuska Peak, Fires Peak, whatever you like to call it, climbing Lazy Mountain. I mean, uh, trails to me um, have a big impact in the community, make it more livable, make it more friendly for children. The railroad trail that leads down past Sheridan, uh, any opportunity I could get to uh, take my kids and now my grandkids out on a trail, I will take advantage of it. Thank you, John. Nathan, how do you feel about trails and pedestrian-friendly connectivity? I, too, um, love trails. And, uh, and I think that um, one thing, I live in uh, Brittany Estates, right over by the Tsunami Center. And one thing that stood out to me when my wife and I bought our house was, um, you know, we were asking a real estate agent, why, does, why do the sidewalks end right there? Um, you know, so I think a big thing, a big thing for me is to um, dedicate some energy to making, well, seeing if, if the public's on board, but um, I think sidewalks would be huge, not only in my neighborhood, but in several of the neighborhoods in Palmer. Um, one of the things that we struggle with is 
you know, if the kids don't have anywhere to be but in the middle of the street, they will be in the middle of the street. And, uh, you know, that's not only dangerous, but it really slow thing, slows things down, especially um, in my neighborhood, it's a lot of through traffic. So um, I think specifically focusing on sidewalks would be huge for Palmer. Thank you, Nathan. Victoria, would you like me to repeat that? Yes, please. You bet. How do you feel about trails and pedestrian-friendly connectivity? Well, uh, starting with trails, we're obsessed with the trails. <laughs> um, every single weekend after church service, we, um, when it's nice out, we pack a picnic and we take our kids, usually get on the rail trail or the Matthews Fair River Trail, and we go have a picnic with our kids. Um, on Saturday mornings, we like to hike the view and whatnot, so we're really into the trails. And we just love how safe the trails are here in the community also. The safety is a key thing for us with our children, and that's something that I hope to help maintain here. And with pedestrians, um, I also agree that pedestrian safety is a huge thing to focus on, and that um, adding in sidewalks, or in, in that case, focusing on infrastructure, and just building up the city as a whole where it's at, I think that's very important. Thank you, Victoria. Andre, how do you feel about trails and pedestrian-friendly connectivity? Years ago, there's a sidewalk on Felton that really rarely got plowed by the city. I took it upon myself to clear it to make sure that the students had a place to walk on. So the reason why I say this is that those trails and sidewalks are a great thing, but we have also considered that is going to cost more funding to maintain those trails. We can include that in our budget because those trails are often off, off the road path and they're hard to get to. So you need to have a way to be able to clean those trails. I mean, they're nice during the summer months, but I like to walk them during the winter months as well, but they're not always plowed or, or maintained. So when we do get um, built through trails, we need to make sure that we can actually maintain them well. Thank you. Our next question, we will start with Nathan, followed by Victoria, Andre, and then John. So this goes back, my friends, a little bit to what we talked about earlier, and that is voter participation and lack of voter turnout. Like the borough, will you commit to provide a voter pamphlet to every registered voter? So Nathan. Like the borough, will you commit to providing a voter pamphlet to every registered voter? Uh, yeah, I don't think I'll need my 60 seconds. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you, that was easy, eh? <laughs> Thank you very much, Victoria. Like the borough, will you commit to providing a voter pamphlet to every registered voter? Yes, I do. I think that's very important. Thank you. Andre? Now, are you asking me the person to go get a pen to every person? No. But uh, as far as the, the, the city doing it, yes, I, I do think that that's important that we have a pamphlet to, to deliver to, to each individual, um, to the voter itself, as long as it's, it's nonpartisan. Thank you. Thank you. And John, while you're picking up that microphone, like the borough, will you commit to providing a voter pamphlet to every registered voter? Uh, sure, I don't see any reason why the city council couldn't provide something like that. We're talking about around 1,700 households that would have to receive this. There are 5,100 registered voters, but a lot of combined households like my, my own. Um, so yeah, you're talking to 1,700 pamphlets, and I don't think that's uh, beyond the scope of something we could provide, so certainly. Thank you. All right, our next question, we will start with Victoria, followed by Nathan, then John, and last, Andre. Victoria, what work experience or life experience do you have that will help you to govern and serve on the city council? Well, I am a very dedicated mom, and I feel like a lot of times, um, that experience is actually very useful because I've taken that job very seriously. So um, just like hearing both sides of the situation when something happens and then coming to middle ground with my children, I think it's the same thing in city council. It's very important that you hear both sides of the situation, even
even if people are heated or sad or upset or happy, right, for their different differing opinions. It's very important that you hear both sides and then you come to the middle and you say, how can we do this so that everybody in the community benefits from this decision that's made? Thank you. Nathan, what work experience or life experience do you have that will help you to govern and serve on the city council? I think there's some less important stuff and some more important stuff. Um, the less important stuff would be um, professional background in, in finance. I'm not a stranger to reviewing budgets and making sure that uh, everything's kept track of. Um, but I think the more important stuff is just, I've been here most of my life. Um, I live in Palmer. I care what it's like to live in Palmer because I live in Palmer. And uh, you know, just being here every day, going to local businesses, using the local infrastructure, um, just being part of Palmer is a huge benefit when you go to do something like this. Um, and I think that's really the most valuable experience anyone up here could have. Thank you. John? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the most important thing I bring is a, a lifetime around Palmer and uh, 29 years of marriage to my lovely bride, Rosetta, and uh, we raised our four children two sons and two daughters here in Palmer. But uh, I could try to squeeze it in 60 seconds, my lifetime of experience. I worked in the Alaska legislature. I ran the budgets for Central Emergency Services and the Kiski Fire Department down in Kenai and Silver. I worked for FEMA, uh, and I worked as a government relations director for a dozen years. I also worked for the past almost six years now at the Don Young Alaska Job Corps Center here in Palmer. Uh, helping young adults ages 16 to 24. So I believe I bring a lifetime of experience to go along with my almost two and a half years on city council to the, to the table, and uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to do that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Andre, what work experience or life experience do you have that will help you to govern and serve on the city council? But when I think myself years ago in the 80s, I became a youth editor of a college university in Arkansas, as well as a chief photographer. Came to Alaska and I worked in the field of construction. I recently retired the last year from Local 302 as an equipment operator. I worked at Prudhoe Bay. I'm currently the president of the Matthew Mountain King Jr. Foundation. And I understand the uh, rock removal order, which is very important to have some kind of order when you do conduct a lot of business meetings. And when you don't have that, usually you'll have people that will have agendas and not follow the rules and things get out of order. So I think that we have ability, I have the ability because I work with different people in different areas, different aspects, and then with the foundation, I have uh, to work with different businesses, different foundations, and different communities. And I think that really has a big, uh, a diverse asset. Thank you. All right, um, Andre, I'm gonna let you hang on to that microphone. We will start with you, followed by Victoria, then John, and then Nathan. Andre, what public safety issues do you think are most problematic to Palmer, and what can be done to fix it? Okay, I said it earlier, it was ethics for the police department uh, when they deal with individuals. To me, it's kind of hard if you have a certain degraded opinion about a certain segment of the public to actually serve that public. I think that we need to take a, a proactive view when it comes to homelessness, um, working with the health foundations and other social foundations. I think that the departments, as well as the fire department, need to be more versed and get more um, information and equipment as for your car kits and any information they can have to help the homeless people rather than approach them and not understand those type of behaviors because everybody did not behave the same in certain situations maybe they was recognized when a person is having some type of uh, medical or mental issue. Victoria, what public safety issues do you think are most problematic to Palmer and what can be done to fix it? 
I think that something that has been brought up many times is the vagrants and the homeless, um, as he also just brought up. I think it's very important that we put a positive plan in place to strengthen and enforce code and compliance. Uh, Vibrant City is one that is created by a civil community that has safety and security as its core foundation. And if we are going to have code on the books, then they need to be adhered to. And I think a big portion of that is our support to local law enforcement and also to the state troopers and also to fire and EMS services. Thank you. All right, John, what public safety issues do you think are most problematic to Palmer and what can be done to fix it? Let's talk about public safety a little bit. Um, the last three years, we've added three sworn officers to the Palmer Police Department. We've added a, a few paid personnel to the fire department. Uh, we're gonna take a look at what we're going to do as a city folks. I mean, 25 years ago, uh, I was putting together multi-million dollar budgets for central emergency services and McKissick the fire. Neither Soldatna nor McKissick has the population base that Palmer has. And we're serious about having people uh, if we wanna have that kind of protection. But I do think we need to address the issues and I think we'll get maybe further questions on uh, the homelessness issue and just the general feeling of safety in, in Palmer. And not everybody is a, a big fat guy, 6'3", 270, and I realize we're gonna create the safety uh, for everybody out there, so thank you. Nathan, what public safety issues do you think are most problematic to Palmer and what can be done to fix it? Um, I think, the, not to revisit sidewalks again, the, the low-hanging low short thing that springs to mind is, is helping um, kids not be in the middle of the street. Uh, that's huge in my neighborhood. I know it's huge in other neighborhoods in Palmer. And um, it's really rolling the dice when it's not necessary to roll those dice. Um, and not separate issue, but not to revisit annexing. I, one of the reasons I am pro annexation is being able to offer support for Palmer Fire, Palmer PD, and, and spread that support a little bit. You know, if you find yourself on the other side of the Connect Bridge or up Palmer Fish Hook or even just in Soapstone, um, you have to wait on the troopers to get there. And while they're doing their best, they have a huge area to cover. And um, it would be huge if we were able to offer some, some support to the communities that are right next door. Thank you very much. Our next question, we will begin with John, followed by Nathan, then Victoria, and then Andre. John, how do you feel about businesses impacting residents in downtown Palmer, such as parking and noise? Yeah, we mentioned, I mentioned that earlier. We need to, uh, as we get more businesses involved in Palmer, we need to do a thorough review of our parking issues. We have heard from folks, and it's certainly real. I, I've been to Palmer L House on the weekends and seen uh, Friday and Saturday events that have three and 500 people taking up every parking spot in Palmer. So as, as businesses come in, they need to adhere to the codes that we have on the books and uh, look at, um, and we can look collectively as a community of do we want to build more places for, for our businesses so people do have a place to park. Thank you. Thank you, John. Nathan, how do you feel about businesses impacting residents in downtown Palmer, such as parking and noise? Um, I think that uh, parking is a more complicated issue. I think we've talked a few times and a few of us about the geographic constraints of Palmer. Um, five square miles is not a lot. And when you consider, you know, agricultural, industrial, public, residential, once you have all that chopped up for different zoning, parking lots become really hard to find a spot for. Um, so I think that that's a really complicated issue that deserves a lot of thought. Um, I think that as far as noise is concerned, um, we have to find a way to balance supporting local business with making sure they're compliant with, with code. Because uh, from my house, I can often hear, in, on the weekends, I can hear music and whatnot, and for me and my wife, that's not a big deal, but I can imagine if I was trying to put a kid to bed, it becomes much a much more big deal. Um, so I think just enforcing the codes that already exist is a huge step in the right direction. Thank you, Nathan. Victoria? How do you feel about businesses impacting residents in downtown Palmer, such as parking and noise? 
I think that there is a there is a reason that the rules are in place um, and the codes in place for parking for different businesses. And I think that it's really important that the city council hold firm to those rules that are already in place. And then we also help find more parking, like I mentioned earlier, uh, for more businesses to come in and be here. Um, I will say that I think it's really cool that we live in a community that we all feel so safe to go to the Palmer Ale House and enjoy a concert on the weekends. I think it's really cool that we enjoy a town and a community where we can have something like Friday Fling, where we can all come together and you hear kids running around and giggling and laughing and having fun. So sometimes those can be really frustrating when I'm trying to put my kids to bed, but I try to remember that in other places, it's not like that. So I just really try to be thankful for that. Thank you. Andre, would you like me to repeat it or would you? You've got it. <laughs> um, with the noise, to me that's that's a live city. You know, it's a city that's thriving, and that's got some, some viability, it's got some, some, some excitement about it. Especially if anything that's happening on in the daytime with the businesses that are around that should take advantage of their foot traffic, because a lot of times they don't want to get their foot traffic. So I do encourage the businesses that uh, in that area is to open their doors up and take advantage of that foot traffic. As far as the parking, you know, that, that's a tough one because we're so socked in as far as space-wise and we want to keep the, the, the area beautiful and not really tear it up as much. I do recommend we also have a lot of uh, off-site parking, but the responsibility of transporting people back and forth has to be on whoever, whoever the event holder is. Thank you, Andre. All right, next we will start with Nathan, followed by Victoria, then Andre, and lastly, John. I'm gonna take a moment here and say, oh my goodness, people, you have given me such a variety of questions. I am like going through these saying, this is amazing. So thank you for challenging me and challenging our candidates. Well done. However, Nathan, I decided to give you all a rest. Nathan, get ready, everybody. What makes Palmer special to you? 60 seconds is not a long time. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't grow up in this, within the city limits of Palmer. Um, I grew up off the Palmer Wasilla, closer to Wasilla. And one of the things that my wife and I learned when we moved here three years ago was when you kind of grow up in between the two, you just think of the valley as the valley. And um, you just kind of assume it's all sort of the same thing. And then we bought a place in Palmer, and in the morning we can go to Vagabonds or Noisy Goose or wherever we want to go, and at night we can go to the Ale House or any of the other local businesses that just make Palmer fun. Um, I think Palmer is small, it's not crowded, you can get through it, um, and it hasn't lost any of that small town charm. It's done a good job of supporting the local businesses um, and it's done a good job of staying interesting. Um, as, small as, as small as it is, you would expect it to be a lot more boring, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> no, it is not. Victoria, what makes Palmer special to you? Okay, I'll try to get this in 60 seconds. What makes Palmer special to me? Um, when my husband and I were asked, uh, when my husband was asked to move us to Alaska um, to expand the company here, we moved here and in trusting God um, to move here. And this has been such a healing place for our family. Um, the relationships that we've been able to make with the, the like-minded people that are around us, the safety that our children have here to play outside and to play in the neighborhood with their friends, and the relationships that we build with people. The small businesses, I'm able to go down to like a market all the time and just buy fresh produce and buy from a milk share that's okay here and support the local farmers. And all of that, I just think is just such a blessing. We're very blessed to live here. Thank you, Victoria. Andre, what makes Palmer special to you? 
Many may not know this, but years ago, probably in the 80s, the Ku Klux Klan put a petition in to march in the city of Palmer. And the city of Palmer declined it. And at that time, I lived in Anchorage. And when I heard that story, I said, you know what? I think I want to move to Palmer. <laughs> because they have a unique characteristic to know that certain things are just not acceptable in our society. And that's one reason why I moved out here. The other reason I moved out here, I live in a community, Britain the States, where the mayor moved next door to me. The council member is next door to me. I have another council member, two of these guys here live in my neighborhood. I have a former um, airport commissioner that's been next to me. That never would have happened in a bigger city. So just to be able to mingle with people and that are just seem to be common folk that often I even pray with them. And that's the blessing that I have for this small community. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And John, what makes Palmer special to you? Well, what makes Palmer special to me is, of course, it's where I grew up. And uh, we had the egg ranch uh, out here in the Outer Springer way, way back in the day. My father passed away when I was two years old, but uh, people still remember him, still remember Totem Eggs. Uh, Palmer, when I come out of, when I go into church, Palmer Church of God, as the uh, Board of Trustees President for them, I go to church on Sunday morning, come out on Sunday afternoon, and I just take a deep breath, look at Pioneer Peak, and think, man, the week's going to be great. Uh, Palmer's where I wanted to raise my kids. Luckily, we came back here in 2004 to do that. Um, two of my kids now live in San Diego and Juneau. Life takes its uh, twists and turns. Uh, ironically, our 19-year-old son lives in Wasilla, but he named our granddaughter Palmer. So Palmer's <laughs> as special to me as a kid. Thank you, John. All right, our next question. We will start with Victoria, followed by Nathan, then John, and lastly, Andre. Listen carefully and I will speak slowly. What about controversial gatherings on city property? Do you think that is something that should be brought to the public before these events are held? I shall repeat that. What about controversial gatherings on city property? Do you think that is something that should be brought to the public before the event is being held? My answer is that if an event is safe, happy and healthy for the community, then that is an event that should be held in Palmer. Thank you, Victoria. Followed by Nathan. Controversial gatherings on city property. Do you think that is something that should be brought to the public before the event is held? Um, I think I'm going to demonstrate a little bit of my own ignorance here, but I think um, I don't know the ins and outs of the process for getting an event approved in, this, in the city, um, but I have never found a situation where I'm driving through the city and I'm confronted with, with anarchy. Um, so I think the city has done a good job at making sure that what's taking place in Palmer is, as you highlighted, safe, enjoyable, and um, I think this, this, this is one of those situations where the status quo is, is sufficient. Thank you. John? Thank you. And we don't regulate uh, freedom of speech so much, but uh, we have a process in place. We try to adhere to it. If some, I think, extremely rare bad actors are out there and do something that, that is going to create controversy in the community, we'll have to address it. But as far as uh, addressing it beforehand, I mean, I hate to take away uh, people's rights in the interest of uh, making everything as permitted and regimented as possible. John, Andre. I said it earlier about the meeting we had uh, with the Ku Klux Klan with the council, and I think that was a really good infrastructure the city of Palmer had at that time. And I think as long as it doesn't step on one's um, personal um, rights, that doesn't harm and it doesn't uh, intrude upon the, the love of the city itself. I think that uh, the infrastructure they have now seems to work. It worked back then. 
and I'm sure they're going to continue to improve it, uh, the city of Palmer and, and its people that make those decisions. But they, they, the moral aspect of what's right and what's good and just for the community itself, and realize that it's not that you want to step on anybody's rights, you just have to understand that this is a, a, a specific and particular community, and you have to still cater to that. Thank you, Andre. Our next question will begin with John, followed by Nathan, Victoria, and lastly, Andre. And feel free to take just a moment because you're going to have to have three answers. What do you see as the three most pressing issues affecting Palmer today? John? In our library, public safety, fixing infrastructure issues that we have. Thank you, John. Nathan, what do you see as the three most pressing issues affecting Palmer today? Um, I'm gonna steal a couple. I think uh, public safety is, is huge. I think finally getting the library rebuilt is also huge. Um, it's been quite some time and I think that's important. Um, another pressing issue in Palmer, and maybe this is the Valley more broadly, but certainly uh, is true of Palmer, is that we've had a lot of growth in the past handful of years, um, but a lot of growth in areas like housing. And the median list price of a house has skyrocketed over $500,000. Um, you haven't seen the average household income grow at that rate. It's creating a lot of barriers for home ownership. Now we've highlighted the geographic constraints. The residentially zoned land within the city has been highly developed and they're building now. Cedar Park is in its first phase and that'll be huge. But doing things to make Palmer an attractive hub for continued development outside of Palmer is gonna really help us increase supply and make living here easier for people that want to live here. Thank you, Nathan. Victoria. What do you see as the three most pressing issues affecting Palmer today? I think one of the big issues is supporting COVID compliance. I think the second main issue that has been brought before everybody is getting some kind of agreement on the library. And I also think um, the infrastructure support is very important. Andre, what do you see as the three most pressing issues affecting Palmer today? Like I'm getting to death, library number one. Uh, number two, I want to get rid of this flat rate of water usage. Now, I know we got residents here that pay 5,000 gallons, use it or lose it. I think that's ridiculous because my wife and I, we may use 2,500 gallons. The rest just goes for the police. So that's a really unfair tax on homeowners. Number three, um, snow removal for roads and airports and sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Nathan, we're going to start with you. Nathan, followed by Victoria, then Andre, and lastly, John. Again, I'm melding two questions here. Why do you want to serve on Palmer City Council? And why should we vote for you? I chose to serve on Palmer City Council, or to run for the opportunity to serve on Palmer City Council. Um, I think the main reason is kind of what I highlighted in a previous question, which was having been raised in the Valley, I just had this sort of one Valley sort of perspective, and moving to Palmer, it became immediately evident that this was something special. And being here and enjoying what makes Palmer special makes it me feel an innate obligation to continue to protect what makes Palmer special. Um, so I don't have a ton of like public service experience, but I just, I did feel a calling to be involved to make sure that Palmer continued to do the things that made Palmer attractive to me in the first place. Um, I think that I think that that's a valuable attitude. Uh, this is not the jump start of my political career. This is just me trying to give back to the community that I live in. Thank you, Nathan. Victoria, 
Why do you want to serve on Palmer City Council, and why should we vote for you? I want to serve on the Palmer City Council because I think that I have a lot of really good ideas. I've met with a lot of local business owners and a lot of landowners, and I think that there's a lot that could be done in Palmer. Um, even just here with the railroad crossings, I think there's just some really cool um, different ideas that have come in through that, and I think restoring those tracks and bringing the train back in, and I just think there's so many cool things that could be done here downtown. And I'd really like to be there to bring those ideas forward and help other people bring those ideas forward and really support that. And I think people should vote for me because I'm a good person. I have great morals and values. I love my country. I love the city. And I love the people who live here. All right. And next, that would be Andre. Why do you want to serve on Palmer City Council, and why should we vote for you? Well, I think one thing, being a council member, you have to be able to influence people. And I am proud to say in 2003 that I was able to receive the award of Influencer of the Year. Now, I don't know what I influenced, but it must have been something very important for the city of Palmer to recognize that. <laughs> and my service goes beyond this campaign, because after it's all said and done, I will still be out there talking to businesses and working with businesses to bring events into the city of Palmer. We initially chose to go to Wasilla, and it did work out as well because the infrastructure was a little bit different and hard to work with. So we found better to do what we do here in the city of Palmer. Besides, the Glen Nancy Theater is one of the best theaters to have to have an indoor event. Secondly, I've spoken at various different meetings, city and the borough, and I think by being a participant on the outside does influence, but I think it's even better for me to be on the inside to work with those individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. John, why do you want to serve on Palmer City Council, and why should we vote for you? Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. I want to continue to serve on Palmer City Council. There are some projects that need to be complete. Library, first and foremost, that happened 19 months ago. It took a long time to get a 4-3 vote to even move forward as we have now. I was the person on City Council that tried to lower the bond from $10 million to $8 million. Was outvoted six to one, but I wanted people to know that we have other ways to get that funding, and we did get five million dollars from the state. Um, I think I do a good job on council. I don't want to be on there forever, but I think I've uh, earned another three years on there, and I think given that time, I'll continue to work hard. I'll continue to advocate for Palmer everywhere I go, and uh, I hope that everybody here gets out and votes on uh, Tuesday. Let's have a big voter turnout in the city of Palmer. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. All right. We, just so you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have three questions left before we go to closing comments. And we will start with Andre, followed by Victoria, then John, and lastly, Nathan. Thank you, Andre. Victoria, what would you do about the farmers in the annexation area? No beds and city limits, but there is a need to protect from predatory animals. I also think it's very important that we support people to be able to arm themselves and to protect themselves against 
animals. But I also think that it's important that um, these farm, the farmers put things in place to protect their animals. And sometimes it needs to go beyond that. And I do support that. Thank you very much. John. What would you do about the farmers in the annexation area? No guns and city limits, but there is a need to protect from predatory animals. Well, I just uh, agree with two speakers before me. Has to be a way to uh, be able to provide that kind of, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of the predatory animals that uh, exist and are you know, going to be rolling around, but, um, but you know, I, I have no issues with uh, making sure that everybody can stay as safe as they possibly can. I might have to ask the folks out at Dupree's Farm or someplace what kind of animals they've been uh, having to uh, deal with out there. Thank you, John. Nathan, would you like me to repeat the question? Okay. What would you do about the farmers in the annexation area? No guns and city limits, but there is a need to protect from predatory animals. Um, my personal opinion is that uh, an exemption should be offered immediately. Um, I think that that's very low risk. Um, I don't think that has a ton of overlap with whatever rationale came to be that uh, the no gun and city limits um, will come about. But I think that as far as protecting agricultural land or you know your farm, your livestock, uh, no problem with an exemption being offered for that. Thank you, Nathan. Our next question. We will start with Victoria, followed by Nathan, then John. And lastly, Andre. Bloomsbury Publishing just reprinted an eight book series from Children's Revision, Young Adult to Adult. The request by concerned citizens has always been to move specific, explicitly sexual books to the adult section. If moving books is banning, isn't that what Bloomsbury Publishers just did with eight books? Do you call this action banning? And why? That's a biggie. Do you want me to repeat that? Yes, please. Okay. Bloomsbury Publishing just reprinted an eight book series from Children's Division, Young Adult to Adult. The request by concerned citizens has always been to move specific, explicitly sexual books to the adult section. If moving books is banning, quote unquote, isn't that what Bloomsbury Publishers just did with these eight books? Do you call this action banning and why? What she did was say that my books aren't appropriate for children to read. That's what she did. She put the books into the adult section. If a book has, because you use some of the words, I will say uh, pornographic material, how old do we have to be to enter a site that contains porn? We have to be 18 years or older. So if a book contains pornographic material, I do believe that it needs to be in a section that children would not go in and just immediately see, pick up, check out, and read. If it needs to be available in the library, then it needs to be, like I said, in a section where children don't go into a room and see that. And it's great because at Palma Library, um, the children's books are in a different room, so they don't need to be in there. Thank you, Victoria. Nathan, would you like me to repeat the question? That would be great. It's a biggie, I know. Bloomsbury Publishing just reprinted an eight book series from Children's Division, Young Adult to Adult. The request by concerned citizens has always been to move specific, explicitly sexual books to the adult section. If moving books is banning, isn't that what Bloomsbury Publishers just did with these eight books? Do you call this action banning, and why? I would not call that action banning. I do think that limiting access is the first step on the greasy hill, and I think that it should be done with an ex like an extreme amount of thought. Um, so if the, if the question is, is moving a book, banning a book, uh, I certainly don't think so. But I do think that when we start limiting access, we open ourselves to limiting access to all sorts of things. And I think that it's important that we do it slowly, if at all. Thank you, Nathan. John, would you like me to repeat no, the question? Thank you. 
I don't think what a private publishing company does as far as moving their books is considered banning. I will tell you, uh, I left home at 16, ninth out of 10 kids. I was the oldest one in my family to leave home. All the students at Job Corps stopped and said, oh, no, no, you mean you were the youngest one, right? I go, no, I was three months from turning 17. My brother left home at 14, three sisters left home at 15. Not every teenager is created the same by any, any stretch. I agree with my uh, member here on my left that uh, it's a slippery, slippery slope if you start talking about how we're gonna eliminate the ability for people to get access to reading material. I think it's, it's I, don't, I don't mind what they did. I don't have any issue with them putting it in, a, in their creating an adult section, but uh, I, I do think you have to live long and hard before you start uh, uh, eliminating reading material from teenagers. Thank you, John. Andre, would you like me to repeat the question? To me, there's a difference between banning and removing. And if you remove it uh, out completely out of the library, that would be considered banned. But to place it, to move it to a different section of the library, to give the parents the option to allow their minor child to have access to it, I don't have any problem with that. But to put it in the section where the children should to review it, yeah, I, um, to, to, to put it in another part of the library, no, that's not banning at all. Now, if you simply say the material is explicit and it should be removed, I do have a problem with that. But you have to be really careful, like John, the other gentleman said today, was it David? Uh, maybe it's the same. Uh, I do agree with that, you know, it has to be, you know, it's, it's a real uh, tight issue to deal with. But the most important thing is that the parents have the right to allow their child, our child, access to the materials. Thank you, Andre. This is the last question from the floor. We will begin with Nathan, followed by Victoria, Andre, and Leslie John. Nathan, as a candidate, it is natural and appropriate to highlight your talents and strengths. But can you share a mistake, weakness, or regret with us? What did you learn and how did you grow through that experience? Um, I think if I were to highlight one weakness that I think is most applicable to what I'm running for here, um, I have a hard time not seeing both perspectives on a lot of issues. I find myself fence sitting a lot, um, which is a good quality in some ways. You want to be able to take in points of view across you know, multiple planes, but you know, in a position like this, ultimately a decision needs to be made. And I think that one thing that would definitely, would definitely be an area for improvement on my end, if given the opportunity to be on city council, um, is to learn a lot about decisiveness and when the time comes to make a decision, whether that's a budgetary decision or a policy decision or a code decision, um, you know, a decision is going to have to be made regardless of the many perspectives. There can only be one decision. So that would be a weakness for me. Thank you, Nathan. Victoria, as a candidate, it is natural and appropriate to highlight your talents and strengths. But can you share a mistake, weakness, or regret with us? What did you learn, and how did you grow through the experience? I think that I tend to be a little bit too trusting of people. And I think that sometimes in doing that, it doesn't allow me to see the whole picture sometimes, or really um, observe what's happening. And so I think by really getting to know people that are around me and asking the hard questions and really getting into a deep relationship with them before I trust them is very important. Thank you, Victoria. Andre, as a candidate, it is natural and appropriate to highlight your talents and strengths. But can you share a mistake, weakness, or regret with us? What did you learn and how did you grow through the experience? Well, one thing I've learned that sometimes I get really emotional about certain things. I do have a lot of passion about certain things. I have to realize that it's not personal, that I have to put my, my personal opinion aside and deal with the, the actual core of what's going on in, in a meeting or, or a, an event or a, a issue that's brought up to the assembly. 
And how I feel with John came that is to understand the Bible goes in order. They kind of put me in perspective on how to govern and be professional when you're dealing with the people's business. Thank you. Thank you. John, would you like me to repeat the question? No, okay. Thank you. Um, so my father died before I turned two, so I learned most everything and inherited most everything from my wonderful mom. Uh, intellect, political curiosity, uh, love and respect for my fellow human being. But one of the things I inherited from her is impatience. And sometimes I get a little bit uh, frustrated at the uh, snail's pace of things that happen, not just at the city level, but the borough level, the state level, the federal level. Sometimes the grind is uh, uh, almost too much, but I think it's important to stay the course and stay through it. I wish there were times where I had to take a uh, be healthy of uh, patience and just, uh, you know, maybe not be as uh, as forceful as I am, but part of that is just the way I was raised, so I'll look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you, John. All right, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, each candidate will have 30 seconds to provide a wrap-up, and we will start with Andre, followed by Victoria, then Nathan, and lastly, John. All I can say is, no matter what happens at the election, I am still going to be the serving person of this community. And I can either be on this side, or I can be on this, or the council side. But whichever side I'm on, my heart will still be the city of Palmer. And I'm not just going to go away. I mean, you may want me to leave, but at this point in time, I do not plan to use this opportunity only and campaign just this season, because my season is more than just today. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much. Victoria? Can you repeat the question? There is no oh, question. I'm sorry. You're good. Okay. Hey, she's quick on her feet, folks. Okay. Ending. We're ending. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, I just want to take a moment to just say thank you again so much to the Rotary Club for putting this on. And I just want to say that in this whole campaigning process, I am just so appreciative of all the relationships I built, all the people that have invited me into their homes and sat with me and talked with me. You guys have been so sweet, and I've just loved all the relationships we've built. My kids have just really enjoyed this. So thank you guys so much for doing this, and God bless Palmer. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Nathan. Yeah, I just, uh, I'll do it again. I'll thank Rotary for putting this on, and thank you guys for, um, you know, we already touched on how little time there is to dedicate to this sort of thing, and we're not even on the council, and you're here listening to us talk, so that's fantastic. Um, I love being in Palmer, um, and to be honest, at times I feel way too busy to be pursuing something like this, but I just feel an obligation almost to, to give back to Palmer in any way that I can, and if it's not this, then it'll be something else. So, thank you. 30 seconds to close, that's gonna be tough. Thank you, Cheryl, Rotary, Thanks. thank you, Mike Molesky, thank you everybody for showing up and being here tonight. And also thank you to my fellow candidates. It's not easy to put yourself out there to answer questions, to go door to door, to talk to people in the community. So I wanna thank these folks for putting themselves on the ballot. Remember, we vote Tuesday. You can also vote tomorrow and Friday at Palmer City Hall, but uh, make me proud. Let's get the 15, 20, 30% voter turnout. And I hope you consider voting for me. Thank you. Thank you, John. I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that yes. As I look around the room, I am so proud. I love Palmer, and I love the fact that we've got this tremendous turnout because you care and you love your community. And I want to extend to each one of you, I know it's not easy. I, I've served on city council in a previous life, and it's difficult. But you've put yourselves out there, and each and every one of you brings tremendous talent and intellect to the table. And you answer some pretty tough questions um, 
pretty rapidly on your feet. So, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for your candidates.